Hey there, and welcome back to Englishes Around the World. Today I'll be talking about a topic that is, without exaggeration, one of the most controversial topics in linguistics, namely pigeons and creoles. Now, why are pigeons and creoles so controversial? I can think of at least three reasons for that. First, a major factor is that pigeons and creoles have been misunderstood and misrepresented for a very long time. In the last video, I talked about colonialism, and it is in that context that pigeons and creoles came about. The first descriptions of pigeons and creoles that exist come from administrators who didn't know anything about language and who were, of course, thinking along the lines of the racist colonialist ideology that was prevalent at the time. So that means that there is a long history of a discourse that portrays pigeons and creoles as deficient, primitive languages that are less than fully human. When we talk about pigeons and creoles today, the echoes of that discourse are still with us. So let's do a little thought experiment. Let's say that you are a native speaker of a creole, for example, Jamaican creole, and it's your first language. That is, it's the language that you're most comfortable with, the language that you speak with your family and friends, and the language that you use to express what is most important to you. Let's further say that you decide to study linguistics at university, where you get the assignment to read a paper with the title the world's simplest grammars are Creole grammars. Imagine what that must feel like, yeah? So someone with scientific authority states that your language is simpler, less sophisticated than other quote unquote normal languages. I'll tell you what I would think in that situation. I would think, oh boy, there we go again, yeah? It's impossible to read this and not be reminded of every insult that you've had to endure up to that point. The irony is uh, the paper itself is written with the best of intentions. The points that it makes are well argued, but in my opinion, it doesn't sufficiently distance itself from the hateful ideology that its title superficially resembles. Anyway, that's the first reason. The second reason for the controversial nature of the topic is that there's a lot of relevant data that we simply don't have. We have a lot of data on pigeons and creoles as they are spoken today, but we know relatively little about what happened linguistically when plantation colonies were set up in the Caribbean in the 1600s what West African languages were spoken, what varieties of English did the colonizers speak, how did the emerging Creole sound at first. Practically all of these questions need to be inferred via indirect evidence, and that of course leaves a lot of room for different theories. Third, pigeons and Creoles have been linked to other notions that are hotly contested in linguistics. Specifically, the development of Creoles from pigeons has been portrayed as evidence that children possess an innate universal grammar that allows them to take very unstructured linguistic input and then flesh it out into a complete systematic grammar. Many linguists these days reject the idea of universal grammar, and so this puts the study of pigeons and creoles at the center of a heated debate. So basically, if you say anything about pigeons and creoles, you can be sure that at least some people will be seriously offended. Um, you can watch me get into trouble in the next 30 minutes or so, and you have a chance of getting in trouble yourself if you leave a comment below this video. So join the fun and let's go. Here you see a map of the e-wave varieties of English, and our focus today will be on the blue upside down triangles, the pigeons, and the brown pyramids, the creoles. The map gives you a rough sense of the geographical distribution of pigeons and creoles. The pigeons that are represented in the e-wave are in Africa, in Polynesia, a lot of creoles are in the Caribbean, and then we have some in the Pacific and in Polynesia again. Here's a closer look at the pigeons. You see the African pigeons, Butler English in India, Tokpisin in Papua New Guinea, and Pitcairn English which is spoken on the Pitcairn Islands and the Norfolk Islands. In this map here, 
I have uh, marked up some of the Creoles. There's Gullah in the United States, Jamaican Creole in the Caribbean, British Creole in England, Sierra Leone Creole, and Torres Straits Creole. Okay, so you have a rough idea of the parts of the world that we're talking about and the varieties of English that are pidgins and creoles. My plan for this video is the following. Before we get into the big controversial questions, I want us to get a sense of what we're talking about. So I would like to start with a data example, namely a closer look at Nigerian pidgin. We'll listen to a recording, we'll look at words, sounds, grammatical patterns, etc. And after that, we'll get to the more general questions. What are pidgins and creoles? Can creoles be distinguished from other languages? And finally, how do creoles develop? Okay, so let's get started with Nigerian pidgin. The example that I want to play you comes from a book by Dagmar Doiba, who has studied this variety of English. I'll put a link to her book in the description below so that you can take a look if you want to. And what I'll do is I'll play the recording to you first and you can read along. And after that, we'll talk about some of the features and characteristics of Nigerian pidgin. Okay, so here we go. Check your time there, it's now. Five minutes, it goes to o'clock. It's already time for our pigeon news. For today, when we number 17 day for the month of May, when we number five month for the year 2000. But before I go show clear for the newspaper, I will tell you that the ones when carry Kanda for inside. One hand, they carry heavy loop for head to I make. The Lagos mainland local government don't set task force when you go follow put eye to monitor how private sector people when they do dirty carry carry work to do and well well and proper proper. Now they got for that council that Haji Bashir Bonarewa tell our new to people say the work of the task force now to make sure say people when they stay that local government area cooperate with the law when the council put on top dirty matter for that area. Elijah Bonarewa context a lot to the body of Lagos State House of Assembly on top. The new step when them won't take on top those when they do street trading for Lagos State now. Now true when one noise or nine they grow flowers or nine make the number one Ogbonge group on top Igbo people matter or Hannes the Indigo. Don't they tell every Nigerian people say the celebration of them Igbo Day we won't show face for on the 29th of May. No go cause and make people not celebrate the first year of this government for office. Because picking you no know, this new papa. One former Oga on top of Fofa and Toku Matao, Chief Uche Chuku Merije, say they not go dance that day and they not go do any other kind of celebration than but make everybody when be Igbo man top. Tabi Igbo woman, wherever they do, to keep quiet and be silent for three minutes by twelve o'clock that day. To show say then they mourn and be the squeeze space on top of them brothers and sisters them when pie during the civil war. Okay. So that's Nigerian Pigeon. I'm sure that you've been able to recognize and understand bits and pieces, but at the same time, there are also many parts to this that you simply cannot figure out on the basis of standard British English or standard American English. So um, what I would like you to do here is a little exercise. I would like you to go back to the recording and listen to it once more and I want you to find three expressions that you can easily recognize and translate. Also, I want you to find three expressions that you simply cannot understand. Yeah? Once you're done with that, I want you to find three features of pronunciation that are similar to or even identical to your variety of English. And then finally, I need you to find three pronunciation features that are different. Right, so listen to the recording once more and be on the lookout for structures and sounds and then let's figure out what features characterize Nigerian pidgin. If you're ready, if you want to do that, do it now and I'll continue in three, two, one. Here we go. Okay, so here are some Nigerian pidgin expressions that I'm sure some of you have on your list. Yeah? The first example, talk, talk, matter, that means information. Um, the law where the council put on top dirty matter, that means literally the law which the council made for the trash. So in short, what it means is waste disposal regulations. Yeah, what standard British English would express with a multi-part compound. 
Um, people way they do dirty carry carry work. That means people which are in the process of doing work carrying trash. So it's about a waste disposal company. These expressions illustrate a central aspect of pigeons, namely that specialized vocabulary, like for example, information, tends to be expressed through combinations of several general lexical items. In this case, we have the verb talk, which is reduplicated into talk, talk, and that is a noun, and then the general noun matter, okay? So talk, talk, matter, that is information. Trash, dirty matter. So again, you see the uh, word matter there, which is combined into a more complex uh, compound to yield a specialized lexical item. Waste disposal is dirty carry carry work. So there's an important point here. Pigeons can express any kind of idea that you might want to convey. You can talk about quantum physics. You can talk about abstract concepts and say exactly what it is that you want to say. But in many cases, the expressions for these abstract concepts need to be assembled from relatively general words like matter, people, work, dirty, and so on and so forth. In other words, when you are reading a Pidgin English text, you're going to see a lot more so-called basic level vocabulary than in a text on the same topic that has been written in a high contact L1 variety. Another observation that I'm sure you made is that the text contains several words from languages other than English. For example, Oga, which means chief, Una, which means you in the plural, yeah? or the discourse marker O. Pigeons are contact languages, and so elements from different languages are combined together and are integrated into the pigeon. Let's talk a bit about pronunciation, and here I'd like to focus on differences between Nigerian pidgin and standard British English or standard American English. On this slide, you see a chart with the vowel system of English, and one feature of Nigerian pidgin is that the so-called trap vowel, which you see in the lower front part of the vowel chart, yeah, the a eh that you hear in trap, that vowel is pronounced further back in the mouth in Nigerian pidgin. So it sounds more like trap, yeah? Um, so for example, in the word hand, instead of the eh that you hear me pronounce when I say hand, the speaker in the recording pronounces an ah. Uh, let me play this to you. One hand they carry heavy look. One hand they carry heavy look. One hand they carry heavy look. Okay, so that's the backing of trap. Another feature can be heard in words such as month. Yeah? Here, the vowel is also pronounced further back in the mouth. When I say month, I produce an ah. Yeah? The speaker in the recording, on the other hand, produces a sound that sounds like an o, oh, month. Yeah? Let me play this to you again. For the month of, for the month of, for the month of. Okay, that is the backing of the so-called strut vowel, which turns into the lot vowel. And then, Instead of the interdental fricative, th, the final sound in month is an alveolar stop, a t. So what the speaker says is month rather than month. Let me play this one more time. For the month of, for the month of, for the month of. Okay, we also have dental stopping in words such as there, which are realized as der, yeah? Right, one final vowel feature that I'd like to mention is the monophthongization of the face vowel. I realize that vowel as a, when I say the word face, uh, our speaker produces the monophthong a. Let me play that to you. Now to make sure say, now to make sure say, now to make sure say. Okay. So there are a bunch of pronunciation features that characterize the sound of Nigerian pidgin, but of course there are also a couple of interesting grammatical features. Maybe you noticed the element done in the recording as in the Lagos Mainland Local Government Done Set Task Force. Done is a grammatical marker, a marker of what linguists call grammatical aspect, and the marker signals that an action has been completed. Another aspectual marker is day. 
Now here you need to be careful because uh, they does not mean they, okay? It's easy to misunderstand. Uh, they is not a pronoun. It is a marker that signals that an activity is ongoing. So that would correspond loosely to the present progressive in standard varieties of English. Um, I'm going to the store, yeah? Um, now, an example like im they grow flowers means uh, it. So im means it. It is in the process of growing flowers. That's about a tree that is growing, uh, growing flowers. So this illustrates another characteristic of pigeons. Um, grammatical distinctions are expressed. Yeah? There is a way to signal progressive aspect, but that is done not with morphological affixes, but rather it's done with separate words. So this linguists would call periphrastic constructions as opposed to morphological affixes. The next example on this slide concerns negation. Nigerian pidgin uses a type of negation that is found in many L2 varieties of English, namely pre-verbal negation with no. Dem no go do any other kind of celebration. Pre-verbal negation with no is so prevalent in learner varieties of English because it is so straightforward. You just use the grammar for a regular verb phrase and then you put no in front of it. Yeah, you get a grammatical structure for free in a way because you're reusing the regular verb phrase. Um, the third example here is the little word say, which appears in its role as a so-called complementizer. That is, it functions as a word that introduces a complement clause. Standard English has the little word that for that purpose. I hope that you are well. And Nigerian pidgin uses say for exactly this purpose. So um, to show say them they mourn, that means to show that they are in the process of mourning. If you're wondering, is that use of say related to the verb say itself? Yes, that's absolutely the case. Yeah? It is what linguists call a grammaticalized variant of the lexical verb say. Many languages, in fact, have complementizers like this that derive from a verb that encodes a speech act Quite often, it's literally a verb that means say. Sometimes the meaning is a little different. Okay, let me show you three more examples. One that you probably figured out yourself is the word way, okay? This is a relative pronoun similar to standard English which. And um, when you have an example like everybody way be Igbo man, that means everybody who is an Igbo, yeah? Relative clause constructions are grammatical structures that have a nominal, in this case, the pronoun everybody, and then there's a relative pronoun, way, and uh, this is followed by a verb phrase. In this case, be Igbo man. Everybody, way, be Igbo man is thus structurally like the boy that ran away or the guitar that I like. The second example on the slide is the plural marker dem, dem brothers and sisters. There are many L1 varieties of English that use the word them in exactly this way. So you're probably familiar with it one way or the other. Lastly, I'm sure that you noticed a couple of reduplicated patterns in the recording. Carry, carry, talk, talk, proper, proper. In many languages, reduplication is not just that you say the same word twice for emphasis, let's say. Rather, uh, reduplication has grammatical meaning. It has several grammatical meanings, in fact. So often, uh, one meaning that you find a lot is intensification, but it can also be plural or it can be duration. And there are a couple of other functions. In Nigerian pidgin, reduplication has as one of its function, the function of changing the word class of an item. Um, so you can make a noun out of a verb with reduplication. So this happens with talk, talk. Talk is a verb and means, well, talk. Talk, talk is a noun and means discussion or a speech. Yeah, you see how this works. Uh, carry means carry. Carry, carry means the act of carrying something or the activity of transporting things. These examples illustrate a very simple point. 
Nigerian Pidgin has many grammatical features that make it differ from standard British English or American English. Some of the features are present in other L1 varieties of English and so we might think of them as retentions from the L1 dialects that were spoken by the very first users of Nigerian pidgins, the speakers of English who came into contact with speakers of West African languages and who needed to figure out some common tool of communication to accomplish a trade. Other features are due to the process of adult speakers finding such a common tool of communication. So the fact that general words are overrepresented, well, that's a sign that adult learners were putting together a basic vocabulary that proved successful in day-to-day -day communication. Yet other features are transfers from languages other than English. So there are lexical words from West African languages, but also reduplication is a pattern that we quite often see in West African languages. Let me emphasize one thing that Nigerian pidgin is not. It is not to be qualified as simple or primitive. Those are simply the wrong categories to use here. What we can say is that Nigerian pidgin shows traits that are typical of adult L2 acquisition. When adults try and learn a new language, certain structural patterns tend to emerge and these patterns are heavily represented in Nigerian pidgin. Okay, I think you have an impression, so I'm coming to the second part of this video in which I want to talk about pidgins and creoles more generally. I have three questions that I want to discuss, namely, first of all, quite basically, what are pidgins and creoles? Then, can creoles be distinguished from other languages? Do they form a separate class of languages? And then the third question, how do creoles develop? As I said earlier, these are questions that have generated heated debates. So everything that you're about to hear is one opinion among several others. I'll try to make clear what is more or less agreed upon and what is more controversial. And then you can decide for yourself how to proceed further. Yeah, you're going to have to read up on these controversies and form an opinion of your own. Okay, so what are pigeons and creoles? Let me start with pigeons because we've already seen an example, Nigerian pigeon, and anyway, pigeons are a bit easier to define than creoles. So here's a quote by Michel de Graff, professor of linguistics at MIT, a well-known creole specialist and also a native speaker of Haitian creole. Uh, what he says about pigeons is the following. Pigeons are simplified, lexically and structurally reduced, unstable non-native systems with variable and inconsistent patterns created and used for limited communication among adults who are native speakers of mutually unintelligible languages. Let's take this apart, starting with the end. Pigeons are created and used for limited communication among adults who are native speakers of mutually unintelligible languages. This is typical of trade colony scenarios. Speakers without a common language try to communicate for a limited purpose, and that purpose is usually trade. In the initial stages of this process, the pidgin is necessarily variable and inconsistent. Yeah, you recognize that part of de Graaff's definition. Everybody uses the pidgin a little differently, and uh, there are at first no conventions on how to do things conventionally. Every speaker uses their best guess as to how to make the communication successful. Early pigeons are therefore unstable, non-native systems. And because they are produced by speakers who don't have any common tool of communication, they are lexically and structurally reduced. Think about it this way. When you establish a first contact, you don't use highly specific vocabulary because that would reduce your chances of successful communication. And you also don't use highly complex syntax because again, that would make your point harder to understand. You try to achieve communicative success by using as few words as possible and as basic a syntax as possible. Yeah? So this is a strategy that is chosen by speakers who have 
a full-fledged L1. So it's not because the speakers of a pigeon don't have the ability to use language to its fullest extent. It's because they're in a situation where you need to communicate with someone who doesn't speak your language and you don't speak theirs. Moving on to Creoles, de Graaf has the following to say. Arguably, a Creole is a pidgin that has become a full-fledged language by stabilization and expansion as the pidgin acquires native speakers and or becomes the primary language, the vernacular, for some or most of its speakers. You notice that de Graaf hedges this by arguably, which we'll come to in just a minute. The crucial notion here is the acquisition of native speakers. A Creole is someone's native language, and it's used as the main primary tool of communication. In the process, there is stabilization, that is, what used to be variable and unsystematic in pigeons becomes more systematic and conventionalized in Creoles. And there is expansion, that is, the Creole is used across all domains of life, and it is fleshed out in terms of its lexicon, which becomes more diversified, and its grammar, which builds up complexity. So, just to review the differences very quickly, pigeons don't have L1 speakers, Creoles do. Pigeons are used for a limited range of purposes. Creoles can be used in all domains of life. Pigeons, at least at first, are highly variable and inconsistent. Creoles systematize. Pigeons have a limited vocabulary and Creoles have a more diversified lexicon. Pigeons tend to not have inflection. Creoles, well, they do have some inflection, even though, as we'll see, inflection is more or less the exception. Creoles tend to have periphrastic constructions more so than inflection. Okay, something that puzzled me when I was first taught this as a student was I wondered how pigeons could ever persist since they would turn into creoles after one generation of speakers, okay? So how can a pigeon from the 1600s or 1700s still be spoken today? Shouldn't it have turned into a creole by now? Well, pigeons can persist if they are only used as second languages, yeah? if they never become a home language. In trade colonies, contact between two languages may be sporadic so that you only use the pidgin every now and then, and so it's nobody's main home language. And even later, after colonialism, a pidgin may stay a lingua franca that you sort of know and that you use every now and then, but that is not your main language. Okay, so everything you see on this slide is relatively uncontroversial. So let's get to the issues that are a little more contested, which includes the question of whether creoles really come from pigeons. But first, can creoles be distinguished from other languages? Do they form a separate language type? Early in this video, I mentioned that there is a long history of colonialist discourse that presented creoles as languages that are different. So this question will always have an echo of that ideology. What is agreed upon is that Creoles develop under specific socio-historical conditions. They develop on plantation colonies where enslaved people are under the obligation to use the language of the colonizers with relatively little exposure to that language. The enslaved people speak several different uh, ones and at least at first they do not know each other or they're even kept from getting to know each other. Several traditions of Creole studies have argued that this social history is really all that uh, different Creoles have in common, meaning that Creoles can be defined socially but they cannot be defined in terms of linguistic structure. The paper that you saw earlier with the title The World's Simplest Grammars Are Creole Grammars argues a different point. McWhorter argues that old languages such as English or Spanish or Portuguese have built up considerable complexity that does not serve any functional purpose in present day use. So McWhorter clearly doesn't glorify old languages. He simply mentions that, well, they build up complexity that doesn't have any purpose, any functionality. For example, in English, 
you sometimes have to use the definite determiner the, sometimes you have to use the indefinite determiner a, and sometimes no determiner at all. So can you explain to me why it is grammatical to say in July without the article, but it's not grammatical to say in evening. Yeah? It has to be in the evening. That's the kind of complexity that McWhorter talks about. Uh, it's very hard to learn for L1 learners because it doesn't follow any discernible logic. And so it's what McWhorter calls ornamental complexity. It's nice to have, but it doesn't serve any purpose. McWhorter argues that Creoles, because of their relatively recent history, have not yet had the time to develop ornamental complexity. So he identifies a Creole prototype, which he defines as a language with no inflection, with no tone, and with no lexicalization, at least not a very long history of lexicalization. No inflection means that grammatical information is not expressed through affixes, things like plural suffixes or past tense suffixes, case endings, and so on and so forth. Creoles do express grammatical information, but with other means, namely with separate words, what linguists call periphrastic constructions. Empirically, Creoles do show a relative absence of inflection. So on this slide, you see data from four Romance-based Creoles, Angolar, Palanquero, uh, Papiamento, and Seychellois. And you see that for many grammatical categories, those four don't have any affixes. Case, number, gender, person, tense, mood, aspect, you know, the usual suspects where you would see affixes on verbs or nouns. And um, here the table is actually pretty empty. Now, there are old languages that have little or no inflection, and perhaps you know one of those or even speak one of those. Um, if any of you speaks Mandarin Chinese, for instance, or Vietnamese, yeah, they don't have affixes. Are they Creoles? No, they're not. Yeah? And they're not because they have what linguists call tone. That is, the pitch or the pitch contour with which you pronounce a word changes the meaning of that word. It acts phonemically, like a phoneme. Creoles don't have tone, which makes them different. So if a language does not have affixes and it does not have tone either, that makes it likely to be a Creole but there is one more feature, namely lexicalization. Um, lexicalization means that there are old words that have parts which no longer mean what they used to mean. Take an English word such as understand. Understand has two parts, under and stand, but you and I know that understand semantically is definitely not the combination of under and stand. Or take another example, husband. Do you recognize the first part of husband? You can probably figure it out. Yeah, it's house. Um, but for a present day speaker, of course, there's no relation between husband and house. I guess you could make one up, yeah? But you weren't aware of this when you were using the word husband uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that is lexicalization. Old words have parts which no longer mean what they used to mean. And Creoles tend not to have that. In the Nigerian pidgin text that we saw earlier, the expression, people way they do dirty carry carry work, there we have every semantic component expressed by a separate word, okay? So this is sort of the opposite phenomenon of lexicalization, a very analytic presentation of complex ideas where every component idea corresponds to a separate word. Right, so this is McWhorter's Creole prototype. No inflection, no tone, no lexicalization. If all criteria are met, we likely have a Creole and we have defined it in structural terms, not in socio-historical ones. Uh, Michel de Graff argues explicitly against this and he makes the point that I mentioned earlier, namely that defining Creoles in terms of the absence of features, yeah, the absence of features that quote-unquote normal languages have, that is a discursive move that has at the very least some highly problematic antecedents, namely terms such as broken English, non-standard, or primitive. 
Also, the idea is that Creoles are young languages is open to fairly unfortunate misunderstandings or misrepresentations. Namely, the idea that Creoles somehow recapitulate the early evolution of language. So this in turn frames Creole speakers as pre-hominids or early hominids. And ah, you can see how that is not exactly the thing that you would like to hear as a speaker of a Creole language. Yeah? So you can see that these issues lead directly into highly controversial discussions. And this, of course, brings me to the third and last question for this video, namely, how do Creoles develop? I want to contrast two positions here, namely what is called uniformitarianism or the uniformitarian hypothesis on the one hand and Creole exceptionalism on the other. The uniformitarian hypothesis is championed, among others, by Sally Coco Mouvuena, also by Michel de Graff. Um, Creole exceptionalism is put forward by John McWhorter. Okay, so what do they say? Uh, Mouvuena holds that Creoles are contact languages. That is probably something that everyone can agree on. But where he departs from what many other Creolists are saying is that Creoles, for him, don't develop out of pigeons. He calls this a myth. Um, and then he argues that the features that Creoles exhibit are due to founder effects. So the varieties that come together when Creoles first emerge, they have features that then combine and yield the Creoles that we see spoken today. McWater, on the other hand, argues for what he calls Creole exceptionalism. So he subscribes to the idea that pigeons develop into Creoles. So Creoles are pigeons at first and are then extended and they stabilize and they form Creoles. And uh, McWater argues that a break in transmission leads to the loss of superfluous ornamental complexity and that this leads to the emergence of the Creole prototype. Okay, I want to look at both views in a bit more detail. So how does Mufwena support the uniformitarian hypothesis? Um, to start out with, he observes that present-day pigeons and Creoles are spoken in different parts of the world. You saw this earlier in this video in the map that I showed where the Creoles are spoken and where the pigeons are spoken. Um, so we have lots of Creoles in the Caribbean. There are not many pigeons spoken in the Caribbean. Yeah? Why is that? Shouldn't there be the remnants, no? the, the first stages of the Creoles somehow retained? They don't appear to be. Yeah? So pigeons arise through sporadic trade contact and Creoles develop on plantations. Creoles are the result of repeated cycles of adult acquisition of an L2. A first group of enslaved people learns a variety of English, and then newly arriving groups of enslaved people learn from the first group, and so on and so forth. So there are multiple cycles of learning. And um, Mufuena also argues that the role of children in Creole formation is limited. What I learned at university was that children are really mainly responsible for a pigeon developing into a Creole. Interestingly, neither Mufuene nor McWater hold on to that position. Okay, so let's turn to Creole exceptionalism and uh, John McWater. Um, when adult L2 learners create a pigeon, they leave aside features that are unnecessary for communicative success. I mentioned that earlier. So when you are trying to make a successful trade, you are not going to sabotage your own efforts by using words that are highly rare or complicated and syntactic patterns that run the risk of you being misunderstood. So these features are then conspicuously absent from Creole grammars, namely inflection, tone, or lexicalization. So even when the known input languages have complex features in one area of grammar, uh, the resulting Creole will tend to reduce 
that complexity. And McWater gives an example for that, namely the Creole palanquero that we saw earlier in the table with uh, the missing inflections. So palanquero is based on the West African language Kikongo and on Spanish. And we know that both Kikongo and Spanish are highly inflecting languages. Palanquero, on the other hand, does not have a lot of inflections. So if Creoles were just language mixtures, McWater argues, wouldn't we expect that a mixture of Kikongo and Spanish would mix and match the affixes of the two languages so that also the Creole would be highly inflecting? Yeah? Instead, we see that many grammatical categories that Kikongo and Spanish express morphologically with affixes are not expressed at all in palenquero. Yeah? At the very least, this is a puzzle that is in need of an explanation. Right, so there are many complexities that I have not been able to fit into this video, but I would strongly encourage you to explore further for yourself. For example, by watching lectures by Salikoko Mufwene, by Michel de Graff, and by John McWater. All three of them have a tendency not to mince words, so they will tell you pretty much exactly how they disagree with each other. So be prepared for that. Yeah? That's all for me at this point. I hope to see you again for the next video. And until then, thanks for watching and bye bye.